why I put this up as much for the commercial. It's important that we all tell the world about ourselves. We're all interested in gaining market share and, uh, and, and making a profit in this world. But I think the part that I wanted to point out was that all these lead APs that I was talking about before really was irrelevant as I learned because so much of the uh, emphasis that our company put into learning about green was backwards. About three years ago, I insisted that uh, our company, particularly our key managers and so on, become lead APs. And to the point I was joking with Joe about, and some of you, we ultimately, many of us became lead APs because we were able to uh, hole up in a room and study for a long time and go take a test and pass. And we all become lead APs, and I put this in our promotional literature, and big deal, so we're lead APs. We had never worked on any green projects, any lead projects. It isn't until you actually put the implementation into place that the whole concepts of what responsible green building actually means and we learned that in a backwards way. I was so interested in the marketing aspect of it and making sure we didn't get behind the eight ball. We did what I call level 301 before level 101. So I applaud you in the fact that uh, you're doing it the right way. You're going to get the level 101 first, put those building blocks in place. And at the end of the day, um, I hope to have you understand that this 101, 201, 301, in fact, is the way to do it. If you don't have the awareness and understanding in place, I dare say the implementation aspect is going to be useless to you. So, you know, I, I want to give you uh, some takeaways today. I speak fast. Um, I don't intend on doing more than 15 minutes or so here. Um, I'll give you some prompts, some things that you can uh, check into. Maybe you want to email me. I'd be happy to call, talk to you anytime. I want to give you the who, what, why, where, the W's, so some other background that relates to this basic understanding, and then pique your interest maybe to learn more and some resources to do so. What? You all need to understand this. Have you all seen this? Who has not seen the standard triangle? This is the elevator pitch, folks. You need to know this at the back of your hand. You have three minutes between ground floor of a high rise and the top floor, and you have a potential client, and you want them to consider a project with you, and you want them to consider doing it in a responsible way using green process. And he says, tell me why it's important. What is it? If you can't repeat what I call the triple bottom line, and again, I apologize down there, as encompassed by either three E's, or three Ps, which relate to balancing these legs of the triangle out, the ecology, meaning the planet, of course, the economic aspect, profit, and I'm sorry again that this says equity, people, which is the third P underneath there. You need to be able to tell someone, ladies and gentlemen, at one time, green building was a bunch of tree huggers who were more interested in the planet and the people, and they had no clue how to do it responsibly. It wasn't until about three, four, five years ago that we actually got it and understood that decision makers had no interest in green building unless you added that responsible adjective to it. Simply put, this, this is now an equilateral triangle. All three legs are balanced so that the profit piece, the economic piece, I can assert to you, and I'll show you a couple slides, that you can do responsible green building for the same price point as a regular green building. That's the compelling piece to me. That's the real world. It wasn't that I wasn't interested or decision makers weren't interested in green building before, but you can only talk to them about the environment and the ecology and the people and the social equity so long before they finally say, what's it going to cost me and what's the premium? And until the green movement understood that, the what meant nothing to decision makers. I call it the C-suite, you know, the, the CEO, the CFO, the COO. So sustainability is the core of this. It lies at the center. At the end of the day, whether you're the I, EPA, the Salvation Army, or IBM, at the end of the day, your interests can be aligned with any other organization, whether they're nonprofit or whether they're profit. And you need to understand that as your basis for what responsible green building is. Why would you want to build it when utility costs are going up? I think that's a good reason. Valuations increase if you build green. Um, Green building is just good design. Those are some prompts to think about. But why, why would you want to build green other than the fact that it's the right thing to do? It comes down to what I call three C's. Cost, competitive differentiation, and what I call carrots in the form of incentives. I'm going to touch on this first here, if you'll mind. Uh, it's, it's, this is actually somewhat of an old pitch that I have been giving over the past couple of years. Um, I dare say now that at least in the world I run in, green building, responsible green building is almost becoming a standard operating practice in projects that I'm seeking, 
probably ones that you folks are going to be going after also. There's very few projects anymore that I don't see um, a desire to incorporate green building, whether it's through the LEED process, which I'll touch on in a minute, or not. So it used to be a competitive differentiator. I dare say now it's probably becoming equal. The cost piece, let me touch on that because I think it's one of the most important misconceptions. I'm talking about construction costs, hard costs, AKA, also known as hard costs. I don't want to have you go away saying Tim Panzica said uh, there are no some soft costs associated with LEED certified buildings. Remember, people get accredited, buildings get certified. If you don't, can't remember that one, people will catch you right away knowing that you don't know what you're talking about. People get accredited, buildings get certified. You see these levels here, which I'll touch on later. What you can't see over here is a dollar value here. It says, I think, 0.66%. What I want to tell you that is that if you have the right team at the table, your builder, your designer, your owner, and you have an opportunity to help influence that design and decision making, when it's just a cocktail napkin, I'm talking about conceptual design, you can deliver a green building at the same statistical uh, comparison cost as a regular building. That's at the base lead level, and I'll touch on these in a momentarily, what these mean. But in the world of lead certification, this is called lead certified, level one, lead silver, lead gold, lead platinum. Yes, there's an incremental increase, but I can suggest to you there's a return on that investment for that first dollar cost premium that you'd spend at 2%, 2.2, and 6.8. But the talking point from this is, the on the cost side, just at the base lead certified level, with the right team in place, you should be able to deliver it cost neutral. There's enough information out there now, enough case studies, that you can go search yourself that that is absolutely unequivocally true. So that's the cost piece. The differentiator, this used to be pretty important because I believe people weren't doing it as much, but the uh, compelling factor, if you could tell a school you can get better test performance or earlier discharge, because you have a healthier environment in a, in a school or a hospital, that's pretty compelling. And those are the kind of things now that as in the world that I live in, the world I operate in, these kinds of things are very really resonating with decision makers. They think if they have a better environment, this room is a perfect example of a, a very unconducive room to learning and or producing. It's uh, in the inner core, has, the light's okay, there's no windows, just put a block. And you design a room for young kids with better acoustics, better lighting, um, better overall atmosphere. Forget the energy piece, which is a huge aspect of green building. You're going to probably get better test performance. And apparently, social scientists who do a lot of tests on these kind of things have determined that green buildings, whether it be in the hospital setting, a school setting, or some other settings, in fact, have higher valuations because they've been able to show better productivity. Uh, don't ask me how they do that. You can go do your own research. There's a boatload of uh, information out there that you can search the web on and find it if you're really interested. So the carrots versus the sticks. I'm talking about incentives versus penalties. In the uh, world of municipal government, whether it be local, state, county, or federal, what's beginning to occur is that they're putting in place carrots, meaning tax incentives, credits and or deductions that you're able to reap if you build green. Um, codes that allow for developers to um, have a quicker depreciation if they uh, meet a certain density requirement in a community. There's a whole host of carrots that they're putting in place. Conversely, there are some penalties or some sticks also that are beginning to get traction in the municipal area. Um, if you don't meet certain density requirements, if you don't put certain green features into your building, they might penalize you in the form of uh, higher costs for your permitting and, and some other aspects of, uh, of sticks that might say to a developer and a building team, hey, let's get on board. Let's make sure we design and build this more appropriately. So uh, that's the, the uh, uh, carrot versus the stick thing. So why? Um, the what I told you, triple bottom line. Why neutral cost at the base level, um, competitive differentiator, and carrot opportunities versus uh, stick opportunities. That's, that's the why piece. How do you do it is this. This is pretty important. I made some reference before to having the right team at the table. You want to use what we call the integrative approach. It's a fancy phrase for saying collect your team earlier than later. I mean, all of us in the, uh, in the general contracting construction management business, we have been saying this for years 
why don't the owners and architects use us earlier than later? Well, it's finally getting to the point where it's an easy sell because in the world of responsible green, using this fancy phrase integrative approach, it means they really need to get us on board early. So more opportunities should be present themselves to you if you're on board with the green building approach. Integrative approach guided by the lead process. Notice I said not using the lead process. That's a great, it's a, it's a huge distinction in my mind because the end game doesn't necessarily need a plaque on the wall. And I'll touch on that in a minute. So the how is using this approach, which means everybody together earlier than later. It's a fancy phrase for CM services, for design build. It's a, it's a, it's a fancy way of saying teamwork. That's it. That's really the gist of it. Um, that said, you know, 70% of major decisions are made in the first 10% of a project. The integrative approach requires all of these players. Now before it used to be these two. This is what typically occurred in building projects. It was strictly the owner with the architect, and maybe sooner or later they talked to their financial person, maybe they talked to their facility staff. They certainly didn't have what I call a commissioning authority, which I'll touch on in a minute. And the general contractor, not the CM, a little semantic issue only, wasn't even thought about being brought in until after the plans and specifications were done. Right? That's the rule of general contracting. That, were, that whole delivery model goes by the wayside in the integrative approach. We're not a contractor per se, although people use that phrase. We're a team member who's sitting together at the, at the beginning of the process so that these 70% of the decisions that are being made can be impacted by people that actually help price this out in the real world and understand how to put the, the building blocks together. And that's the essence of this approach here, folks. The facility staff, people actually have to uh, uh, run it afterward. So if you're going to be delivering a high performance HVAC mechanical system, you better have the facility staff there knowing what is part of your design mentality so that they have to take care of it after a ribbon cutting and occupancy, they know what's going on. All too often, the disconnect in the past was that this kind of a representation was lacking. People weren't there. It made no sense in the world. So the, the green movement has helped immensely just in common sense areas of delivering projects. So this is how you do it. Building users, I touched on that. So the integrative approach, uh, you know, if you look at this graphic here. Conventional design and build process, this is what typically happens. Window systems, installation systems, HVAC systems are designed by individual entities. You know, the, the, the typical setup as an architect is hired, but then they go out and hire their electrical engineer, their mechanical engineer, their structural engineer, and every one of these entities, I know they supposedly talk, but the reality is they really don't talk a lot. And you see, you know, you know what I'm talking, yeah, because you see the form of uncoordinated documents, right? Uh. Happens all the time. And these systems sometimes get designed in a vacuum. I call it the cover your backside syndrome. You get an oversized HVAC system, insulation that maybe is over insulated, a window system that's not optimally performing with the HVAC, and you end up having this kind of result. Oversized, less than optimal, employee coordinated envelopes, which results in higher first costs. That's the key. And this is why we sell responsible green building. Any one of these elements done using the integrative approach this simply means that the people are brought together, exact same systems, with the right size system, insulation, windows working in concert so that you have lower first cost. I mean, is any of this rocket science? These are basic concepts, but this was really lacking, and there wasn't enough body of evidence out there that this actually made sense until the green movement came along and really propelled what used to be nothing more than a little fad. It's a deluge now. So hey, again, I applaud you for being here. Understanding this integrative approach, why, why it can drive costs down both on a first cost basis, so you don't have an oversized system and operating costs going forward, that's the compelling value argument for the owners. First cost neutral, ongoing operating costs lower. Integrative approach, there's some key premises. I love some of these. Um, can you actually make it a system less efficient simply by not properly linking the components? The answer is yes. If they're not designed to work with one another, they'll tend to work against. That's like, well, duh. What does that mean? These are, this came from a sharp lady named Hunter Lovins in a book called Natural Capitalism. This is what wasn't happening when the integrative approach wasn't being done. The benefits 
I follow along these principles here. The world I used to live in, architects were just very, very stodgy and rigid. They were resistant. Their inertia was to stifle change. This approach stifles their inertia. And I say they meaning collectively. I'm not going to pick on just an architect. Anybody resistant to the integrative approach. In effect, every assumption, particularly the old ones, are questioned so that every team member in this big session that we conduct at a kickoff when the documents are nothing more than cocktail napkin ideas in your head, we get to challenge everyone to think outside their, their area of expertise. That's the best integrative approach that I know exists. This uh, four E's is simply everybody engages everything every time. Everybody engages everything every time. Nobody has an ego. They should, be, uh, they should understand that every assumption needs, will get questioned so that we maximize the, uh, the design and ultimately the building at the lowest possible price. So I've been talking about responsible green building. What it is, why, and how. And now I'll talk about LEED in general. Responsible green building doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the LEED process attached to it. This is the acronym, you've seen it before, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's a voluntary consensus-based standard by the USGBC. If you're not familiar with it, this tool, and it is just a tool. It's a great tool because it has these checklists in these seven categories that are pretty consistent. Anybody not familiar with these categories? Anybody familiar with the categories? Ever seen them before? Okay, now you have it. These are the categories that guide the lead process. This checklist is used in these seven categories. These first five are, are the major categories. These are uh, a little more um, uh, gray. But it's a great roadmap for any team, whether they want to get a lead plaque, I'll touch on that in a second, or not. This is what guides the, the entities across five very specific categories with some very specific strategies within each category. What you can't see up there is a checklist. Don't worry about it. All I'm suggesting to you is that this checklist, which has sustainable sites, water, energy, and atmosphere, what you can't read in the middle are all the strategies that are in those books that, Nick, you were touch, talking about before. And th these are the roadmaps that we use. Understanding what they are are the key aspects of the lead process. It's actually changed. The old lead checklist version 2 or 2.2 is now called version 3. And I always want to tell you that because it, there were some uh, issues that needed to be cleaned up with that. And I share this with you because um, the lead checklist before in the area of water, for instance, um, would not value reducing the potable water one uses in a project. I mean, it's a pretty basic area of strategy to try and get your uh, water reduction, water usage down, right? Why waste water? And they would give you, they meaning this governing body, the USGBC, a point if you reduce your water by a certain percentage. That's great. Now you got a point as part of this checklist, okay? But they also give you a point if you put a bike rack in your building to encourage people to ride uh, to work and not use an automobile and clog up the highways and uh, we use waste gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. Bike rack for $30 versus a pretty expensive water, strat water reduction strategy, one point a piece, didn't make a lot of sense. So not unlike the credential changes I was sharing with you before, the tier tiered levels of testing, the checklist levels for the lead certification, they got that, the UFGVC, they've reweighted things, they've changed it now so that the bike rack might get you a point, but the reduction in water or reduction in energy usage might get you eight, ten points. Don't quote me on that, but it's far higher weighting. Does that make sense? It just kind of put things back in perspective so that what used to be categories that look equal like that are now weighted differently. You can't read this on purpose because they're kind of useless. Who cares about it? What used to be uh, strategies and acidification, who cares? That's why it's so puny down here. But climate change uh, and indoor environmental quality uh, energy, those are important things, and that's what the USGBC did when they reissued this LEED version 3. So the rating systems are, I don't want you to even pretend like you are going to learn this. All I want you to know is that there's a LEED rating system for different project types. That's all you have to know, know, take, take away from this. 
And that's also a change. Way back when, six, eight years ago, the lead system, which guided a green building, was one size fits all. One checklist, no, no, uh, harm, no weighting of credits or strategies, and whether you're building a school, a retail center, a hospital, a house, or whatever, it was one checklist. All you need to take away from this slide, without even reading it, is that there's now a checklist per, per project type, per building type. Same categories, the same major categories I showed you, those don't change. But the strategies to reach the end game change based on the different project, different building that you're putting up. Okay? So the point systems, to get this ultimate plaque on the wall that looks like this, these are base lead, this olive color. The colors are a little off on the screen here, but what you're looking at is uh, 100 points possible in this <laughs> checklist. This is the one I told you is cost neutral. This is this olive uh, color is base lead certification. You attain this level, this number of points out of 100 possible, leave it at that, I assert that you could do that cost neutral. You could say Tim Panzica said that. Um, we've done it. Tim, is that only on new construction? Yeah, yeah, okay. Being, uh, great point. On, a, on any, f new construction, by the way, can mean uh, remodeling an existing building, too. Well, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, no. I, New no question. Go ahead. Shoot. If you're, if you're, Challenge me. If you're <laughs> renovating a building that's 60 or 80 years old, mm -hmm. it would be cost neutral to renovate that building? At the, lead, at the base lead level. You think so? I know so. I know so. And I'm not suggesting at all that the, the needs of that particular renovation mm -hmm. might not have some unique aspect of it that would blow my assertion away. Okay. Um, but okay, in general so remodeling, yeah. um, I could do a remodeling. Got gut and redo of this building at this level for the same price. Um, it, the only the only time it doesn't hold true is when you have an existing building. You want a green, an existing building, not a remodel, not a major remodeling. And I'll touch on that in a minute. Okay, so these are the levels. The, you use uh, the checklists to get points, the points to ultimately get a plaque on the wall. But do you really want a plaque on the wall? It's hard to see over there. That's the plaque that's actually nailed to a wall there. Plaque versus no plaque. So why do you want to even strive for it? The answer to me is this, full transparency and full verification. You see, if you don't get the plaque in the wall through the lead process to get a lead certified building, you have one of those four levels, you don't get a plaque, but then again, the world doesn't necessarily know if you really didn't cut corners. At least this way, when you accumulate all the paperwork that you were sharing with me in that project that you did, Bill, uh, and trying to assemble all that stuff and make sure it gets collected properly <clears throat> and it gets fed up to the architect in this case. Sometimes the CM has to handle that. But ultimately gets uh, collated, um, turned into the electronic genie, and sent into the, uh, the US GBC, I think it's the GBCI. It goes to electronic genie in Washington somewhere, okay? And they look at all the stuff you've accumulated and it meets the smell test and it meets all the things that they require. You follow all the rules and the books that they give to you. But now at least they know that someone checked that you follow the rules. And that's what I mean by full transparency and full verification. If you don't do that, that's not bad. Please, don't get me wrong, because this is not for everybody. There are some soft costs, not hard costs, associated with getting the plaque. It does cost to register with the USGBC. It does cost ultimately to pay for the plaque itself. Um, could add anywhere from uh, about up to a half percent in soft costs to go through the actual uh, plaque process, I'll call it, okay? But I think it was worth something, personally. But if it's not the end game that the client's interested in, I'm okay with that as long as they want to follow the responsible green process and at least let me use my lead checklist to help guide the process, whether at the end of the day they want the plaque or not. You can only try and sell so much, then you stop and say, okay, I appreciate, uh, at, least you're doing the, at least you're doing green building. Um, this is what I would touch on before. I just want to touch on the credential piece. Everything I just shared with you a moment ago related to lead certified projects. This relates to lead credentialing through the AP process. Um, these are the three levels. I touched on lead green associate. These are now what's called lead AP with specialty. If you ultimately pass the tier one, awareness and understanding, and you want to move on to lead AP with specialty, you pick one of these tracks now. And the track that most people pick is this one right here. It stands for Building Design and Construction, the standard new construction one. Mm -hmm. 
This is primarily for architects, interior design and constructions, primarily for those on the interior design end. Uh, this is existing buildings, operations and maintenance, homes, which I don't think it pertains to anybody in here. And this is an interesting one they carved out for uh, neighborhood development. I think Flats East Bank project, uh, big, big mixed use project that's got multiple buildings, multiple building types. You're like um, an urban planner or something? Urban planner, yeah. Yeah, they might love to have that kind of credential. Um, anybody who's in urban planning and design um, would love to have that lead ND. And then lastly, this is a down the road. <laughs> when, you're, when you're all 67 years old, you want to become a fellow, you can get that. Uh, the good news is with the middle ones, when you finally get this lead AP with specialty, you do have to do some credential maintenance, which is a good thing I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, lead new construction, the gauge of a project's success is simple math. If you spend a dollar a square foot on regular new construction, if this room here was being gutted and redone, it was going to cost me $50 a square foot to do this room. And if I want to do this green, I can spend the same $50 a square foot and deliver a green remodel in this room. That's what I mean by a dollar a square foot on regular equals a dollar a square foot on green. That's the cost neutral thing I was asserting. You with me so far? On existing buildings, oh yeah, sorry, I touched on this. I mentioned the soft costs before. I just want to make sure you understand that Tim, Tim didn't say there are soft costs. Registration fees, if you want to get the plaque, the certification fee. And then I always talk about these because uh, people challenge me on the professional fees. Should architects charge more? Should engineers charge more? Should builders charge more? I say zero to nominal in all three cases because if I was a client, the owner, paying the bill, and I told you my fee uh, is X percent to manage your project or to my profit, and they said, well, now we're going to go for a green, a green building project with the lead certification. What's your fee? I said, oh, you know, it's uh, X plus 2%. Oh, it's a premium. Golly, I didn't know that. And the architect said, architect says the same thing. So as the engineer, if I was the owner, I'd say, why would you want to be learning on my dime? What about responsible green building? It shouldn't just be called good green building, good design. Why is there a premium for you to do it right? So I always challenge AE organizations, if they say they're going to be going into this proposal and they're going to be adding some extra costs for their, uh, the green piece of their, their professional services, I say, I don't know if I really want you on my team. Because I don't really think you want, I don't, I don't want you dragging me down. Because Panzeek is not adding any more money. We just don't, we think it should be part of what your body of work, what you normally would do as part of your normal professional services. You're so, mean the amount of hours that you're going to have somebody on a job. Yeah. Maybe somebody's going to be spending more hours on a job because of that. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, just not filing the paperwork is like alone. Not awesome. much. But maybe yes, maybe no. How, I would suggest that uh, maybe your first one to five jobs, don't disagree, there's a, there's a learning curve. But many clients would say, you know what, that's on you. Okay, um, I'm going to cut the chase here. I'm going to move fast. This is the essence of that approach. The right team uh, brought together early to do a checklist check. When I talk about a checklist check, that big thing you couldn't read across those categories I showed you. You sit down in a room at a big round table and you begin to understand what the goals are for the project and what some of the strategies are that might make sense for the project that you're going to be building. Is water more important than energy? Is the quality of the uh, of the space vis-a-vis -vis windows and natural daylighting more important maybe uh, than if you were a uh, research laboratory and you didn't need light. Some of those things help guide your green strategies and that's what this initial goal aspiration session is using the lead checklist. It's all part of this integrative approach. So you can define parameters, you can collectively agree to outcomes as a team and then, then you begin to do what we call the document, document, document. I mean, this is pretty standard stuff but it's important to be able to mitigate risk, which Joe's going to talk about, to learn to have everybody together so that when you look at this checklist, it's a blown up part. You use a checklist to mark each credit as either yes, no, or maybe. You be quickly go through it and you get a sense as to what strategies emerge as important to the team collectively. And when you're done with that, you'll have that roadmap necessary to help guide the design from a, an idea now to conceptual, schematic, and so on. But after that, it's simply a matter of registering it through that process I mentioned to you, design, build, and prepare the document, document, document. So this is my last slide. Sorry, can we go? Bottom line. I say this at the end of the day. You're going to be wanting to gain market share. People are going to want to know, are you the most aware? Are you a team member or a team 
or a company that best understands. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate you can implement. It's all back to those three levels of 101, 201, and 301. And wherever you're at in the green building journey, get this foundation that the awareness and understanding so that you're able to demonstrate you can implement, do a green project, two, three, so that you are able to use that elevator pitch and you can regurgitate the who, what, why, as well as anybody else, and I think your green building business will increase pretty quickly.